Hello everyone, welcome to a bit of a different video, but um, since I'm on the topic of turbochargers from my last video that I did on the engine, um, I am proudly, I am Garrett Turbo, Turbo Training Certified, completing all five levels of their um, Turbo Expertise Program. And uh, that doesn't mean I know everything about turbos, certainly, but it means I know all the basics and enough to get me started on working on turbochargers because it is something that I could see a career in potentially maybe with Garrett or Precision or some sort of uh, turbo company, engine company, anything with engines um, I want to be a part of in my future. So I have our clone turbo up here on the workbench and I kind of want to go through some basics of it. Um, this video is more to show like what I learned and to prove that like this course works and also to be able to tell people on the spot, so I'm not like scripted or anything of course, but to tell people on the spot different parts and how they work. All right, so I have the clone turbo up here on the workbench and I'm gonna start over here. Um, I always distinguish the compressor and turbine sides by the color. The compressor is always a lighter color because of the materials and the turbine is usually if not always a darker color. And so up here we have the turbine inlet and this is basically the only function of the inlet is to fan all the exhaust or to collect all the exhaust gas that just come from the manifold. The manifold uh, connects right here and this specific one is a T3 flange. But the turbo flange is basically how it mounts to the um, exhaust manifold and you need a turbo specific exhaust manifold uh, in most cases and so all the exhaust gases come into here and as they go through the shroud which you'll kind of see gets smaller as it goes that air is getting compressed which means it speeds up and gets hotter as it goes through and according to Garrett the operating temperature of the turbine side of the turbo is usually between 800 to 1100 degrees and it's uh, lower for diesel engines with turbos uh, and higher for gasoline engines so this thing gets very hot and this thing gets very cold but we'll get to that later so once it gets to the end of the shroud here all of that compressed air is pushed into the turbine wheel down there which tapers as it goes back it kind of goes like this um, the compressor is much more tapered but the turbine has a small taper, and that is the inducer, the turbine inducer, which is the widest part of the turbine wheel, um, or however you want to call it, turbine blade, turbine wheel. But um, So that captures the air, which spins around at, in this turbo, around 180,000 RPM, I'm pretty sure. Um, it could be more, I don't remember the exact number, but that all gets accelerated extremely through the inducer. And then the smallest part of the taper on the wheel is the exducer, which is the very end of the blades here where it's at its narrowest, the wheel's at its narrowest. And then all that hot air comes streaming out uh, through the exhaust system. This leads to the exhaust pipe. And you might be thinking what the point of all that is if it's not actually making you any power uh, because you can't do anything with the exhaust once it's exited the vehicle. So, this turbine is connected directly on a shaft to the compressor side. And um, it's opposite for the compressor side. Like this is the inlet you would think, this is the inlet maybe. Um, I don't really know uh, the amount of the, how much knowledge you viewers have um, of turbos, but this is the inlet for the compressor. And basically this goes to like the radiators and any sort of um, intake for the air. All that air goes into the compressor inlet and the inducer of the compressor in case is the narrower side of the blade. And there are some smaller blades behind these blades which help with the capturing and acceleration of the air. And the whole point of the compressor is to accelerate the air and all that acceleration is turned into pressure. And through this shroud, as you can see, it gets bigger as it goes. And then the compressor um, outlet sends all that air into the intake manifold of the car.
So the two sides do work together because they're connected with that one shaft that gets spun up not only by the exhaust but also by the air in here which accelerates the wheel further but also it's already accelerating so it helps to compress the air and get that to the intake. And then in the middle of the turbo, this is called the CHRA, uh, on the top here we have the oil inlet uh, because oil is used to cool turbos and the oil inlet and then the oil outlet is on the bottom and it's identical because oil basically runs through this and then at the bottom it drains back to the engine uh, with the sump and so this comes out into the engine into the chra um, and then the bearing there's bearings down here and they use different kind of bearings but the usual kind of bearing is a free floating bearing which is basically two bearings that don't touch but have a film of oil between them and a film of oil on the outside of the outer bearing as well. So there's two films of, films of oil constantly going through the turbo which help it spin insanely smoothly and fast. So this is a pretty standard simple turbo compared to the ways that some can get very complicated very fast with the use of actuators and um, electronic control for the geometry. So the geometry is like I mentioned earlier, uh, the A over R, which I don't actually know if I mentioned that, but that is measured from the radius of, so from the center point of the moving parts to the tongue, which is where the, um, in this case, the outlet connects to the shroud. Uh, so this right about here is where it's at. So this radius and then the area of this circle right here, this hole, um, and then you divide that area by this radius and that's your A over R. And most turbos have between a 0.8 to like a 1.1. 1 .1. uh, and the smaller the A over R, the more, essentially the more bottom end you'll have, you'll have faster acceleration of the turbo, faster acceleration of your car, more power in the bottom end but then with a bigger A over R, you don't lose all that power once you get like above a certain RPM and it kind of, your line, your graph starts to go down or flat lines, but you have moderate, moderate graph to where you have a lot more in your top end because you're moving more air, it just takes a bit longer and because this isn't spinning as fast. So that A over R um, can be changed. This is a fixed geometry turbo or a free floating turbo. Um, and so that just means that this A over R doesn't change at all. And a variable geometry turbo, this doesn't change, but there are veins in here, kind of around here, that will open with an actuator that will control how much air can get into the, um, into the turbine at, any given time, how much exhaust gas can get into there at any time. And that essentially is changing the A over R. So it's not actually changing the size, but it's changing how much air. And that airflow really adjusts your performance. So if you have a variable geometry turbo, you can have all the benefits of the bottom end with a smaller A over R and the benefits of the top end with the big A over R because of the ECU controlled veins, which are in here. And then last but not least, what I'm gonna talk about is actuators. And there can be two kinds, and that is pneumatic and electronic actuators. So a pneumatic one is a wastegate, um, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. And it's a big horn looking thing that usually comes out the top of a turbo. And that essentially is a valve in here, it, it would be right here that kind of opens like a engine head valve uh, to let exhaust gas bypass. It basically goes through here instead of going through the turbine. It bypasses the turbine. Um, and that's so that you don't have excess pressure in here. And that actuator is actuated by a, a control rod that goes up here and a little crank down here that gets like pushed or pulled. Um, and once the spring inside the uh, wastegate has enough uh, compression, which this is connected to the compressor side, 
And so it like, once that air hose that connects has enough pressure in it from the compressor, it pushes down the spring uh, preloaded enough to open the valve down here. So it's like, okay, I have this much compression. Now I'm gonna open up the wastegate to let some of that escape by bypassing the turbine. And then the other kind of actuator is an electronic actuator, which is the same thing, except instead of being a compression controlled spring, it's an ECU controlled spring, which with the computer sends signals because it knows what's going on in here at all times. The computer sends signals to that electronic actuator, which opens the valve down here. And then those actuators can be split up into two other groups, the vacuum and spring. And the spring is just when there's enough compression from the compressor coming through the air hose into the spring that the spring gets pushed down enough, which is where boost pressure comes from. So it takes a certain amount of PSI, say one bar, so 14-ish PSI, gets pushed onto that spring, then it's gonna open up that valve. Um, so it's building that pressure, and then the wastegate releases that at that um, amount. And then a vacuum, which is basically the opposite, a spring is in the other direction, and it's pushing on it, and then once there is too little vacuum to hold the preload, then the spring is released enough to where the valve opens. And the vacuum actuators are controlled by a vacuum unit, uh, which supplies constant vacuum, and then a solenoid will open the wastegate. And as for the temperatures of the turbo, on the turbine side of things, they get between 850 and uh, 1050 degrees Celsius, 850 for diesel engines and 1050 for petrol engines. And then the compressor side gets down to about negative 30 degrees Celsius. As for the temperatures of the turbo, the hot side or the turbine can get between 850 and 1050 degrees Celsius. And 850 is for diesel engines, uh, which went a bit cooler over there. And then 1050 is for the petrol engines. And then the compressor side gets down to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit inside there on a normal temperature day. And one last thing for the bearings on the inside that can be damaged very easily if there's any sort of particles fine or coarse in the oil, fine particles will get underneath the bearings because like I said earlier, they're free floating. They can get underneath and wear away that clearance between the oil film and the bearing and make them move uncontrollably, which will make the shaft move uncontrollably and the blades will start to hit the sides of the shroud and that's not good at all. And then a coarser uh, particles in the oil will cause the shaft to score and wear away with um, time and that can destroy a turbo in as few as a few seconds. So it's a very quick process to destroy a turbo if you have bad oil or anything going in there. But that's about it. That's all I have for you. And I hope this was informative in some way. And I know I learned a lot.